In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. The primary reason for making our way through Matthew's genealogy is to affirm that the Word and Son of God has a human face and a human ancestry, a human face so that we can look upon him, and a human history to confirm that the Son of God became truly one of us. This gospel reading is a resounding proclamation of our belief in the incarnation of God. And for this reason, I look forward to it every year. The birth in the flesh of the Son of God is the chief cornerstone of our faith. St. Athanasius wrote that God could not bear to see his creation suffer and die. So he came to us in the flesh, face to face, heart to heart flesh to flesh. He took on a human face so that we could see him. He took our nature upon himself to make it one with himself, causing the 17th century mystic poet and prophet, Angela Silesius, to write this, quote, I am rich as God, for there is no grain of dust that I do not share in common with him, end quote. Sacred scriptures and prophets could never adequately relate the intensity of God's passion for humanity and creation. Only the incarnation of God himself could do that. Love can never remain at arm's length. It was his passionate love for us that caused the Son of God to empty himself, taking on the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of man in the words of St. Paul from his letter to Philippi. The Lord did not think equality with God, quote, something to be grasped, in quote. That is, something to be held on to. So he put it aside and became like us. And that is what love does. The implications of the incarnation are so mind-blowing that we rarely think about it much and many Christians have yet to understand or even accept it. If it is true that the Son of God took our nature upon himself, that is, our nature being what all human beings share in common, the thing that enables us to be human and connects us all to one another as one, then the nature of humanity itself has been transfigured and deified in him in connecting himself with us in the flesh. He has connected us with him in flesh and spirit. Quote, everything has been given us in Christ, writes Thomas Merton. All we need to do is experience what we already possess, end quote. And honestly, the one purpose we have in going to church at all is to celebrate this free gift from God. I was reading in the Proscomedia today, that service where we prepare the bread and the wine, and it says this beautiful thing, thou hast poured forth immortality upon humanity. I remember my systematic theology teacher telling us one day that there is a man sitting on the throne of heaven and we are sitting with him. To us polyglot ORU students who came from every tradition under the sun, that sounded utterly outrageous. And yet, it is true. Human nature in the incarnate Christ has been lifted up into the heavenly places, granting us in this life already the blessings which are to come, according to the liturgy of St. John. The book by Alan Watts, Behold the Spirit, is quite simply one of the best books on Christianity I have ever read. He freely quotes the Eastern Fathers as an antidote to the grave issues he saw in Western Christianity. He writes of the failure to, quote, realize the implications of the incarnation, in quote, and the acceptance 
of the gift of union with God to the flesh as the reason for the weakness of the church. Thus he writes, we have substituted the contemplation of God in the here and now with self-conscious moralism. Let me quote him more directly. Quote, in general, Christians are so self-consciously preoccupied with the things they ought and ought not to do by way of Christian action in a world gone mad that they are absorbed in themselves instead of God, end quote. The consciousness of God is the transcending of self-consciousness. So repentance is this, to change our object of contemplation from ourselves to God. It's as simple as that. To become absorbed in God rather than in ourselves. To turn our hearts and minds towards Him more and more, little by little, until we have finally recognized that we are one with Him and He with us, and it has been so all along. This is the change of mind that transforms everything. Meister Eckhart puts it like this in his usual provocative way. Quote, what good is it to me if Mary gave birth to the Son of God hundreds of years ago, if I do not give birth to the Son of God in my time and my culture, we are all meant to be mothers of God, end quote. We are all meant to be mothers of God. That is a powerful and provocative statement from our lives, Jesus teaches, will flow rivers of living water, and that's not really different than what Meister Eckhart said. We are to be fountains of mercy and compassion for the whole world, birth givers of God through lives lived in contemplation of God. And our goal is the realization of union with the Most Holy Trinity, which has been accomplished for us in the Lord's assumption of our humanity in the Incarnation. It is finished, Jesus declared from the cross right before he died. Nothing left to be done. It has all been done. And what is left is our waking up to it. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.